Well, good morning, everyone. Oh, what a lovely day. I want you all to know you might, you might, you know, say a little prayer that the rain they have forecasted in the schedule will hold up because there is rain. I think it's probably has to do with that California hurricane, but uh, we'll take it just, just Hope it doesn't change its mind. Uh, welcome to the Lord's house today. Coming uh, together and sharing with each other. Welcome everybody out there on Zoom. And uh, wow, good gathering today. Wonderful. Um, you know, I was reading Patty's notes here. We had 82 people. <laughs> receive ministry in person via Zoom or recorded services uh, for this last week. Wow, that's a, that's a very, that's a big number. That, that's wonderful. I usually don't mention that, but this one kind of stood out to me. So um, thought I would share that with you. Uh, don't forget Crafty Ladies, Tuesday, August 22nd, 10 a.m. here at the church. So anybody who would like to join uh, the group, please do. It's a good cause. Um, on the 26th is the Mission Center leadership, and everybody is invited. You don't have to be in the priesthood to join. But, it, uh, but Russ is going to release the Zoom link on Wednesday, is my understanding. So uh, I'll ask Kim, when she sees that, to put it out to everybody, and she's online, so, uh, but if you want to join, please do, if you want to go in person, please do, but that's uh, on the 26th, which is next Saturday. Uh, Labor Day retreat's coming up, September 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. Uh, there is an announcement slide that has the details on it, so if you want to go, it's not too late to sign up, so, uh, if you do, take a look at that announcement that Patty puts out and sign up for Labor Day retreat. September 10th, um, Terry Nice getting baptized. So uh, please join us for that service. Um, I'll, I'll be doing the baptizing part and Richard will be in the confirming part. So uh, it'll be a good Sunday. And uh, please join us uh, for Terry Knight's baptism. Potluck is on September 10th as well. Wow, that was good scheduling. I had nothing to do with it. Terry called me, says I'll be home, but it just works out. We have potluck that day too. So uh, please, uh, if you can make it here to, or those on Zoom, make sure you Zoom in so we can see uh, the service, but uh, there is potluck following. So bring all your good stuff like y'all do uh, every time we have potluck. Don't forget Bible class, 7 p.m. on Monday. Uh, theology class is 6.30 on Tuesday. And I don't think I have forgotten. And did I forget anything, anybody? All right. So, God, welcome to the Shenandoah congregation, whether you're on Zoom or here in person, and I look forward to the service that is about to follow. Uh, Jeremy will come up and uh, bring us our prayer concerns. Please bow with me in prayer. Loving creator, we come to you at this moment and lift many names in need of prayer, in need of support, in need of love. We bring up Kim J, who has a back procedure coming soon, very soon. May you bring her peace and comfort and healing as she goes through this important process for her her comfort in her body. We ask for continued guidance and, and light in the lives of Wayne T and Lisa T as Wayne continues to go through his battle and may Lisa 
find ways to support him as he continues his road to recovery. We also bring up the many uh, Christian churches and Christians in Pakistan and religions and people who are persecuted all over the world. May they find peace, may they find safety, may they find hope, however they choose to come together for the common good of this world. We bring up names that are in our hearts that we have not spoken out loud. Names that we're not even sure need us yet, but may our eyes be open, our ears listening as we respond to your spirit and we respond to those in need. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. There's two things that I forgot that are important. We had our first game day yesterday in the afternoon. It will be on the third uh, Saturday, two to four. So please come. But it was great. We had a great time. And if you can make the, the ones in the future, please do. Something that y'all may not know is that Harriet and Keith are heading back to Missouri. So uh, uh, they're leaving next Monday, not this Monday, but next Monday. So if you wanna send them a note or what have you, please do, but I thought you should know that uh, they are heading back. They're, they're going to St. Joseph, Missouri. They'll be around family and, and people they grew up with and so on and so forth. So I just wanted to pass that along. Good morning. I welcome you this morning to uh, Community of Christ Shenandoah in San Antonio, Texas. And for those of you on Zoom with us and those of you in the sanctuary, we're so glad to spend this time with you, to worship with you. We hope and trust that you've had a week with some joyful moments uh, mixed into your activities, and we anticipate that you will do, do likewise in the next hour. Our theme today is speak truth to power. I wonder what that means, speak truth to power. We're probably gonna find out. You're gonna hear several examples of people who have done that. I'm Carol Burdick. Your speaker for the day is Jim Burdick. And our focus moment is titled, Scripture Speaks Our Confession and will be brought by Apostle Paul as uh, Jeremy Bowles in that. Um, in that role. <laughs> Couldn't think of the right word. Carol White will bring us the prayer for peace. And now I call us to worship with the first verse of Psalm 133. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. And also, I might add, when we fellowship together in unity. Please remain seated now for the singing of hymn number 276. And afterward, we will hear from Apostle Paul with Scripture Speaks Our Confession regarding chapter 11 of Romans. But now, hymn 276, a hymn that I feel describes the love of this congregation, especially where it says, let this house proclaim from floor to rafter. All are welcome in this place. And please remain seated. 276.
Good to see you all again. Hmm. I write to you today as you seek understanding of your responsibility to speak truth to power. This I know because I was once the one who held a position of power. I use that power to persecute all those who were believers in the coming of Jesus Christ. One day, I stood in silence, watching an angry mob stone to death the good disciple Stephen. Because of his unwavering faith in Christ's message, then I stood still silent as they took the clothes from Stephen's broken body and laid them at my feet as if in homage to my position of power. Still, my heart would not accept the truth that was there before me. I continued on the road to Damascus where I hoped to punish other believers. 
it was then that a blinding light struck me and brought me to my knees, unable to see or walk. As I lay there, the voice of Jesus spoke to me. Why do you persecute me? This was not the voice of condemnation, which I so deserved, but the voice of redemption that was so freely offered. I was directed to go and listen and learn the purpose of the truth of Jesus's message. I am no longer the one who stood in silence as Stephen was stoned. Now my life is dedicated to speaking out against any injustice. I beg of you to do the same. Speak out against injustice. Speak out about your belief in the mission of Jesus Christ. Do not stand in silence. Find your voice and your path will bring the message of peace and justice. Apostle Paul, what a testimony you have. Thank you so much for being with you, with us, and we'll look forward to seeing more of you. We're going to still remain seated as we sing number 216, a hymn of confession. God is a wonder to my soul. And just to let you know, there's no intro on this song. We're going to hit it. And right after that, um, Carol White will bring us the prayer for peace. So get ready. God is a wonder to my soul. God is a wonder to my soul. Came into my life one day and took all my sins away. Oh, God is a wonder to my soul. My God's truth has set me In 2007, President Vesey had these words for the community of Christ. Strive to be faithful to Christ's vision of the peaceable kingdom of God on earth. Courageously challenge cultural, political, and religious trends that are contrary to the reconciling and restoring purposes of God. Pursue peace. A statement. The Human Rights Team was established by the World Conference Action in 1984 to continue a careful but sustained exploration of how the church can respond to human rights issues around the world from our peace and justice perspective. Community of Christ is called to be in the forefront of those organizations and movements which are recognizing the worth of persons and are committed to bringing the ministry of Jesus Christ to bear on their lives. We have been admonished to open your ears and hear the pleading of mothers and fathers uh, in all nations who desperately seek a future of hope for their children. Do not turn away from them, for in their welfare resides your welfare. 
In 2018, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights turned 70. The Human Rights Team invites all Community of Christ members to re renew their commitment to confront human rights and violations everywhere. Listen to the messages from those who have devoted their lives and used their voices to speak truth to power. Speaking truth to power in Mozambique. Albukar Sutan, the war in Maz uh, Ma Mozambique from 1985 to 1982 left 250,000 children displaced and 200,000 orphans, while tens of thousands were forcibly recruited and forced into combat. Sultan has devoted his life to rescue the children of war and children's rights. Let's listen to Albukar Sultan in his own words. I hope that someday we will have a world in which children can be treated like children again, and in which they can be given all the opportunity they deserve as human beings. I imagine a world in which humanness would be the guiding principle behind rules and laws. I hope that someday we will reach this ideal. Speaking truth to power in Central America. Oscar Aurelia Sanchez has long advocated for peace in Central America. The day he was inaugurated as president of Costa Rica, he called for an alliance for democracy and social economy liberty throughout Latin America. He was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his role in ending conflict in the region. Mr. Sanchez has these words for us. Courage means standing with your values, principles, convictions, and ideals under all circumstances, no matter what. If you stick to your principles, you will often have to confront powerful interests. Having courage means doing this without fear. It means having the courage to change things. Speaking truth to power in prisons. Helen Perjean has made a lifetime commitment to the abolition of the death penalty and has led a worldwide campaign against capital punishment. My dream is that human rights is what's going to bring us into the new millennium, that the more and more we grow into the sense of our community, our respect for each other, the dignity of people, that we can learn much better how to build a society. It comes back to me, the goodness, and that goodness inspires and energizes. You know how when Jesus was executed, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they are doing. I really think that that lack of consciousness and awareness is what makes us so insensitive to each other. And so we do these things to each other. If we bring people to consciousness, and their own best hearts, they will respond. And so that is what we have to do. We light the peace candle. We light this candle as a way to confess our inactivity and commitment to try speaking truth to power. And as Dr. Jane Goodall says, let us make a commitment to do what we can, however little, to promote peace and harmony around us, to actually take action, to take action every day, not make a promise that is just words. Now remain seated as we sing, let there be peace on earth, number 307.
Good morning. I'm going to take the liberty to sit where Apostle Paul sat since he warmed up the chair for me. I thought that'd be a nice thing to do. Uh, seriously, uh, I don't want to uh, weaken and fall. So I am here. Uh, I may be a little weak, but uh, my spirit is healthy and happy. And I'd like to share today, our theme is uh, to speak truth to power, as you've heard. And it's an exciting and an adventurous theme. And I'd like us to go through this adventure kind of together and look at, uh, at how this theme fits into the month as well. So I looked at the August themes in the old days, uh, and I'm kind of old, so I can remember the old days. They used to have monthly themes and weekly themes. Now we have weekly themes, but when I looked at uh, the themes for these weeks in August, I looked at kind of labeled the whole month as being the miraculous. And our first theme for the month was blessed by generosity. And we studied the miracle of the loaves and fishes from Matthew 14, thir verses 13 through 21, where Jesus fed 5,000 people with five small loaves and uh, of bread and two fish that were donated, at least as I was taught as a, as a youngster, that were donated by a child that uh, offered and, and uh, brought his gift to Jesus, who then fed 5,000 people. We learned that in that Sunday that God is not a God of scarcity, but God is a God of miraculous generosity. And that was a wonderful miracle that, uh, that we studied that day. Our second theme for the month was, why do we doubt? And we studied the miracle of Jesus walks on water from Matthew uh, chapter 14, verses 22 through 33, where Jesus walks on the water and invites Peter. To, in fact, he didn't just invite Peter, he commanded Peter to uh, walk with him. And Peter got up out of the boat and started walking on water too uh, for a while until Peter doubted. And then when Peter doubted, he began to sink and Jesus saved him, pulled him up and put him back in the boat. And the tempest that had risen uh, was uh, stilled and calmed and again, I look at that as a miracle, and it was that God is a, in miraculous command of all the elements and had more command than we are used to seeing. And today our theme is to speak truth to power. And uh, we will examine Matthew uh, 15, 1 through, 1 through 28. Uh, that's not the suggested theme. The suggested uh, scripture theme was a smaller pack, uh, package of those verses, but I want to go to verse one and study it because it may, makes more sense in the, uh, in the overall story. And um, in, in many cases, I've heard uh, ministers say, you know what, let me change that scripture citation because I don't like that scripture citation. It's a hard one to speak on. It's a hard one to preach on. You'll see in a minute. And we would oftentimes run the other way if somebody asked us to bring a sermon on these, on these verses. And that will make some sense in a minute. Uh, in these verses, Jesus may not always sound like the Jesus that most of us would expect. But I think that we can study deeper into these scriptures and maybe see something arise that makes more sense and does sound like the Jesus that we're used to hearing about. And uh, we're gonna study deeply. And uh, the adult class, by the way, the adult theology class, is studying this where we look into the scriptures deeply and get meaning that that might not come to the surface reader and uh, so we'll we'll look at that and here i'm going to say that this is a god of hearts 
miraculously made new, hearts miraculously made new. And let's journey this together. The subject heading for this uh, um, chapter of, of, uh, of Matthew is uh, that which defiles. Uh, some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus uh, from Jerusalem and asked, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? Uh, they don't even wash their hands before they eat. Well, my mom taught me, wash your hands before you eat. So that's almost like God saying, wash your hands before you eat. Uh, but this was seriously something that the Pharisees brought up and, and uh, accused Jesus of having little regard for what was supposed to happen when, when we would eat. And Jesus replied and said, why do you break the command of God for the sake of your own tradition? For God said, honor your father and mother and anyone who curses, and that is to either say or do bad, to their father and mother is to be put to death. This is in the scriptures. And Jesus told the Pharisees and teachers, why do you ignore that? Uh, because, and in fact, why do you try to subvert that? Uh, because you do tell people uh, something that they probably shouldn't do. But you say that if anyone declares that they might that they have something that might be used to help their father or mother, and that uh, resource is devoted to God, then don't give it to your father and mother, even if they're hungry. Don't give that resource to your father and mother. This is what the Pharisees say. <laughs> and this was what Jesus was accusing them of. And that if it's just said, it's devoted to God. I'm going to give this money or this food or this resource to God. Then don't give it to your father and mother. So if you're going to give it to the temple, that, that's good. And they were not to honor their father or mother with this. So thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition, not your like everybody, but your, hey, Pharisees and teachers. So I'm going to take an aside for a minute. And I think you'll tell, you'll be able to tell when I'm not reading the scripture, but when I'm talking about the scripture. And the Pharisees interpreted the Bible and decided that if the sons would tell their parents, we've decided to give our money to the temple, then we can't give it to you and not even give it to you for food to keep you alive. So Jesus responds to their criticism with something like, you have your own criticism where you don't live up to what the scriptures say. And the scriptures, and now we have the Bible, then they didn't have the Bible. Now we have the Bible. Uh, the scriptures say one thing very literally, but you Pharisees use your idea of the scriptures uh, to interpret differently and say that your rules are better than what's in the scripture and apply over biblical command. So Jesus then goes on. You hypocrites, talking to the uh, Pharisees and teachers, you hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. The, they worship in vain, and their teachings are merely human rules. So now we get to the things that defile, and these are the scripture uh, readings that were actually uh, recommended. So I'm going to pick up now with that. Then Jesus called the crowd to him and said to them, uh, listen and understand. It's not what goes into the mouth like eating without washing your hands. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached Jesus and they said, um, do you know the Pharisees took a lot of offense when, you, when they heard you say that? And Jesus answered, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be uprooted. 
Well, now think that's kind of a tricky statement there because uh, God's the creator. What plants are there that God didn't create? And what Jesus is saying, if something comes from mankind, it can be uprooted. What comes from God will not be uprooted. And so he's trying to tell them, uh, pay attention to what, what we've said. And Jesus said, uh, let them alone uh, because they are like the blind guides guiding the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both of them will fall into the ditch. But Peter said to him, explain this parable to us. Now, the disciples, I love them, God bless them, but sometimes they were a little slow getting the messages that Jesus talked about. And this is one of those times. Um, and I love how Peter, he's, he's just such a good one. Uh, I, I love how Peter is so openly honest I don't get it, Lord, that kind of open honesty. It really brings, it lets the scriptures repeat something in a way that Peter can understand. And guess what? Sometimes that repeated message is something that Jim might be able to understand. So I, I'm glad Peter's doing this for us. Uh, so Peter, thank you for asking. <laughs> uh, but then Jesus said, are you still without understanding? Do you not see that what goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes to the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. What we say comes from our heart and our mind. And this is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander, these are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands doesn't defile. Sorry, mom. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to tell her that. She can read it herself. Uh, so anyway, uh, so far, the scripture story has not yet been miraculous, other than it's a miracle that they finally got the message through to the thick, the thick minds. <laughs> Uh, so far, it's not been miraculous, but I think it sets up for the miracle that is still coming, coming, because I think a miracle does come. You see, Jesus has been teaching his disciples a principle, and again, again, they didn't get it. And Jesus is saying to himself, in my mind, Jesus is saying, I've still got to get this message through somehow. So Jesus uh, teaches. And honestly, this next passage is where many of us who do sermons do not want to get involved because uh, the first image, the first reading, the image we get of Jesus is not, doesn't sound like the Jesus that we know and love, but I think it is. And I think we can see it, that it will be. So bear with me for a bit. I'll try to interject some aside comments as I have. Uh, but I'll try to also make it pretty clear when I'm not speaking the scripture. So Jesus, still teaching as usual, uh, moves forward. The next verse is titled, uh, the next set of verses is titled, The Canaanite Woman's Faith. And Jesus left where they were uh, ministering and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And Jesus knows that they're crossing this is me speaking again. Jesus knows that they're crossing into a different tribal area and that they will encounter Gentiles. In those days, Gentiles were hated and reviled and considered subhuman by the Hebrew society. Uh, does our society have people, groups, and believers that maybe we identify as unworthy or worth less? or even subhuman, we might. So anyway, let's get back to the scripture. Just then a Can Canaanite woman from the region came out and started shouting, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. Uh, but Jesus didn't answer her at all. 
And not speaking to her was normal for the Hebrew social structure. That, that This is expected behavior. Now, we look at it, and on the surface reading, we look and say, man, Jesus is being rude. That's why we don't like this, because we don't think of a rude Jesus. And, and uh, Jesus is not necessarily being rude, but in a way, he's showing the people around him, their own, he's mirroring their, their beliefs. He's mirroring their practices. He's, he's doing what they would expect Jesus to do. And the disciples came and urged him, saying, uh, send her away, because she keeps shouting at us. Now, this woman's shouting at them, and they see Jesus doing the expected thing by ignoring her. Uh, you don't talk to women that you're not related to in that, in, in that uh, uh, time period. And then the disciples say, oh, now we're feeling our oats now because he's behaving the way we expect. Now we got Jesus learning the right way to behave. And then they say, okay, send her away, dismiss her, because that would be an acceptable, an acceptable form of behavior. <clears throat> but Jesus didn't send her away. He continued his teaching moment. And Jesus answered her when she shouted and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Well, again, that's, that's expected behavior. I mean, they're thinking, oh, he's telling her that we're worth more than she is because he's here to minister to us, not to her, not to her kind, not to her type of people. He's here to minister to us. So they're, they're feeling puffed up. Their way seems to be working. And again, this would be socially accepted behavior. And, uh, and yet the disciples encouraged Jesus to act in the normal, socially accepted manner and command her to go away and dismiss her. So continuing with the teaching moment, uh, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And in this way, he's going along and seeming to endorse this social behavior. And uh, what did the lady do? She hurried, hustled, and got in front of him and knelt down in front of Jesus and said, Lord, help me. It is not fair, and Jesus answered, again, socially accepted, socially expected behavior. It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. You see why ministers don't want to preach about this, because this, this doesn't sound like Jesus, but it does. In a minute, maybe we'll, we'll pull this out and see. So food for children who count should not be thrown to dogs who do not count. And this is again, still socially ex accepted and expected behavior. But in spite of being dismissed, this woman knew who Jesus was, knew the real Jesus from his reputation and believed in the things that people had said about him and her faith that, that Jesus could help her, and that Jesus would help her and would heal her daughter. And she pressed Jesus. And she said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Okay, I think at this point, Jesus has shown the the expected behavior, the socially acceptable behavior, has shown where that gets you. And now Jesus is dealing with a believer. And finally, Jesus looks at the woman and answers her, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done as you wish. And her daughter was healed from that moment.
that starts sounding like the Jesus that we know and love. And Jesus was teaching a lesson to the people who thought they were better than her. The people who thought they were better than her were expecting him to continue down that road with a, without acknowledging her. And yet he acknowledged her. He healed her daughter. And, and she was made whole. So let's review this scripture. If this looking at the scripture this way is anywhere near accurate, then now we do have a chance to look and say, this could be a miracle because Jesus may have been showing the need for those people to change their hearts. The miracle may be in their heart. The miracle may be that they saw, oh, our way isn't the right way. Our way doesn't end up with children who are healed. Our way ends up with greater dissension between diverse people. So what does it mean to speak truth to power? You stand up for what's right and you tell people in charge what's what, how it is. That's the idea behind the phrase, speak truth to power. And, and it's an expression for courageously confronting an authority and calling out injustices that happen on their watch and demanding change. Sometimes you talking, uh, preaching, speaking truth to power isn't to talk to a powerful person. Sometimes it's to talk to a powerful social point of view, social acceptability. Sometimes you stand up to that social acceptability and you say, that's not right. We don't do that. That's not right. The expression speak truth to power implies a moral imperative. That's, that means you have to, you have to do this. Speak truth to power. Uh, and you stand up for what is right especially to powerful people or social norms, national leaders. And even, uh, even when it's not the easiest thing to do because the people all around you expect different behavior, but it's not the behavior that we want to know and love from Jesus. So speaking truth to power, your beliefs don't make you a better person. Your behavior makes you a better person. So let's talk. Truth to power does not always mean to speak to kings, prime ministers, and presidents. It also means, and may even more so, mean to talk against social norms and against socially accepted ideas, against common acceptability. When I was a little kid, uh, and I'm not saying that this was speaking truth to power. But I was taught to not tell my grandma Klein about my friend Jackson. Now, Jackson's not the Jackson that we know and love in our congregation. Jackson was a friend of mine back in the 1800s. <laughs> and uh, I wasn't supposed to tell grandma Klein because you see, Grandma Klein didn't believe in having friends like Jackson. But then sometimes we have to speak truth. We have to stand up against that kind of belief, behavior, and normalization. And I have to break that chain or I end up continuing it. Um, many of you know that I've had, well, my dad's passed away now, but uh, when they were alive, uh, there were times when I didn't see eye to eye with my parents, and I'll call it their politics. It wasn't just po political, but uh, all of us have political, social, and religious feelings, and mostly we hold these very deeply, but it is important even for things we hold very deeply that we don't allow ourselves 
to become rabid, where we're toxic. We need to have our deeply held social and political beliefs, but not get toxic. I need to be able to sit in a pew next to somebody who believes this way and somebody who believes that way, and we worship together. I need to be able to go to HEB with people who believe this way and believe that way, and we purchase things together. I, I, I need to have that. So that would be ways that we can stand up against the socially acceptable things that aren't the ways of Jesus. So we need to not be rabid. I must, must, must show equal respect for the other person's opinions as what I would hope that they would show towards my opinion. If I don't do that, I shouldn't have that opinion. I shouldn't have opinions, but I want to have opinion. I want you to have opinions. And I want you to sit here and here with me as we worship together. I'd like to give you an invitation. I want to invite you to work today, now, and uh, for, for our existing future to embrace the kingdom of God on earth, in fact, in reality. Don't just hope that when we pass away, we'll go to heaven. That's, that's not bad. I'm just talking about let's bring heaven on earth today. That is what we're called to do. Jesus walked among these people and said, the kingdom of God is in your midst. The kingdom of God is yours. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I believe in Zion. As much as I believe in God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, as much as I believe in those God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, I believe in Zion, which is a name that we call the kingdom of God on earth. It is open to all. It is an invitation to everyone to live there. You don't have to be baptized to live in a Zionic condition. Oh, it may help, and it may be your ultimate destiny, but you can live in a Zionic condition, loving each other. And we, each of us, every one of us, is not only called to enter, but also invited to practice the lifestyle of, a, of eternal life of heaven here on earth. And this is a fundamental of our enduring principles. All people are worthy. We heard the lesson of the Canaanite woman who was totally worthy from her very moment of birth. And her daughter was totally worthy. All are worthy. All are called. There's a place for you in the kingdom of God on earth today. In reality, there is a place for you. You are called to fill that place. And you have skills and you have talents and you have capabilities that only you have. And Zion's not going to be as good a place without you living that way. And us, we are called to reach out, to heal and to minister to those who meet the description of that Canaanite woman, our homeless, our immigrants, our diseased, our afflicted, and I could go on. We, you and I, are called to minister to their needs. Converting them is not part of the equation. Jesus did not convert the Canaanite woman. Jesus healed her daughter. It's as simple as that. We are called to minister. Continuing revelation. Well, I've wanted to talk about this a little bit because I think that what happened in the last couple of weeks I've been working on this sermon is that some things were revealed to me in the study for this. I didn't 
say two weeks ago, have in mind looking at Jesus's behavior as being teaching moments where he was trying to walk his disciples down a path of, of understanding. But in looking deeply into the scriptures, I came up with some of these ideas. It's looking at some of the wordings and some of the meanings that were that are there. And uh, this goes through a, a, a process called exegesis, which is to look into the scriptures and try to bring out of the scriptures what wasn't necessarily written down because there either wasn't room or they didn't know that that was important. Um, and that, that's a way that you can continue to have the word of God revealed to you. We make wise choices and I would ask, invite you to choose. You can choose and begin to find ways to speak truth to power. When the power is the social power that we see around us, in social acceptability, this is our theme today. You and I to speak truth to power. The expression speak truth to power, remember, is, it implies a moral imperative to stand up for what is right, even stand up against social acceptability. Not easy to do. And even when it's not the easiest thing to do, it is still a moral imperative. Let's live lives that speak very loudly and proudly truth to power. I love you, each and every one of you, and uh, that's listening, uh, that's here, that's listening, or that will listen to this in the future. Thank you. Our stewardship. <clears throat> we are called to give to our true capacity and to give not just money, but our time, our energy, our compassion, our forgiveness, and our prayers. We're called to give what is needed. How will we allow our faith to strengthen us and respond to all who are in need of God's healing ministry. The Dalai Lama is a Tibetan spiritual leader. Early in his life, he fled into exile in Northern India and he never returned to Tibet. He felt forced to flee his homeland because the Chinese government had murdered, massacred, tortured, and starved to death over a million Tibetans. In their effort to eradicate Tibetan culture and identity, the Chinese forced Tibetans to dress like the Chinese, to profess atheism, to burn books, and to condemn, humiliate, and kill their elders and teachers. And yet, the Dalai Lama inspires Tibetans to embrace their beliefs, and he has demanded that we think of those who have stolen his land and massacred his people, not as murderers and thieves, but as human beings deserving of forgiveness and compassion. Will our ushers please come forward now? In his quest to benefit others, he wrote this prayer. We offer it now as a prayer over our offerings. Please pray with me. May I become at all times, both now and forever, a protector for those without protection, a guide for those who have lost their way, a ship for those with oceans to cross, a bridge for those with rivers to cross, a sanctuary for those in danger, 
a lamp for those without light, a place of rugs for those who lack shelter, and a servant to all in need. Dalai Lama, may that which we bring this day be acceptable in God's sight. Amen. The ushers will now wait upon you for your offerings and tithing. so glad to have had this hour with y'all to worship together with you and I hope <clears throat> maybe this coming week you'll think back over some of the things that we talked about today and just kind of mull them in your head and, and uh, savor them have a great week and now we're going to join together and we're going to stand for him 637 Lord who views all people precious please stand <laughs> Lord, who views all people precious, worthy of in your sight, who through mercy and compassion calls us forward into light, we accept. bow with me creator dismiss us now with your blessing of love for those whom we come in contact this week may we take some idea we gain this hour to help us navigate our days and may we always feel your spirit nudging us to be a blessing of your love and peace amen and i'd like to send you forth with these one last bit of words for you to think about uh, Mrs. May Bertha Carter, who defied segregation law, gunfire, and the loss of employment to send her children to a previously all-white school in Mississippi, who she put it very eloquently when she said, God has a purpose for all of us, and so God builds in those strengths to do what you have to do, and nobody ever said it was going to be easy, but you have to try. Go mm -hmm. speak truth to power. And those of you can unmute on uh, Zoom and join us to, to visit and talk. Lots of you out there. <laughs> Looks like Kathleen's in a car. Uh -huh. Yes, Travel. Yes.
So are you on the way back, Colt? Yes. No, no. Actually, no. <laughs> no. We are on the way. <laughs> We're on the way from Kansas City. And so we got Cassandra moved in. And now we're headed back to Kansas City to pick up Audrey and Ashley's stuff. And we'll move them in in the low night on Tuesday, stay the rest of the week, and then we'll head home next weekend. Wow. <laughs> Patty, were you able to go to the um, family reunion yesterday? Yes, I went. Good. It was, it, there was only 15 of us there, but it was okay. Oh. So. And did the, any of them get to come and see Jim? Yes, a couple of them did, and a couple of them are coming tomorrow to see him, too. Awesome. Very nice. Yeah. That's great. How's he feeling? Mm. He's feeling pretty good right now. Good. We'll see what therapy does to, to him tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, you, know, you never really do feel good after physical therapy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi, hey, Patty. everybody. Good to see Hi, you everybody. all. Somebody in the sanctuary tell uh, Sam and Carol and Carol what a lovely servant. We really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. It certainly was. Yeah, I love that. I love that theme. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was saying that I thought it was appropriate. Okay, how's that... Jim today? Oh. He's doing okay. Thank you. Oh, Uh, Richard was just saying that she felt like today it was very appropriate for Jim to sit because, uh, you know, in scripture when it talks about Jesus teaching, he sit first. He sat oh, there you go. He taught. So he was he was teaching us today and he sat. Mm -hmm. Good job, Rabbi. <laughs> 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 so patty where are you guys at now or where are you headed well uh, jim just got moved to rehab on friday so um so cool. he's had the weekend off but therapy starts again tomorrow oh good yeah. kathleen where are you all headed uh we are between chicago and kansas city oh are you <laughs> headed back this this direction uh, we're going to Kansas City first, picking up stuff, and then moving Audrey and Addison on Tuesday. And we'll stay the rest of the week, and then we'll head back next weekend. Oh, cool. Richard, you look cool with those glasses. <laughs> uh, well, well, have a good week, you. everybody. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, Bye Pat. <laughs> hey, Audrey, what are you doing? <laughs> Not much. Just chilling back here. I'm a little, I'm a little packed in at the moment. I'm, nice. I'm in one seat and then everything else is <laughs> And Addison's got the middle row to herself. So she's she don't show her. Oh, okay. Addison said don't show her. I was about to show her. <laughs> <laughs> she's 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 taking a nap in the she's chilling in the middle seat so I got my little compressed seat but I got some pillows so I'm pretty comfy. <laughs> Hi Carol. Hi Nana. Hello. Hello. So y'all are getting moved in? Yeah, on Tuesday. We're going uh -huh. to Kansas City. We're getting there tonight. And then tomorrow, while dad works, we're gonna be packing up the we, the screens are letting us borrow like a flatbed trailer and then we're packing up the SUV. And then tomorrow night, we're going to Lamoni and we're staying with uh, Terry and Dee Jones. And then gotcha. we're moving in Tuesday morning, which it's going to be a hundred degrees oh, in Lamoni. Oh. And 
I'm really lucky because move-in's not supposed to be until one o'clock. It's from one to five. And I was like, can I move in any earlier than that? And I get to move in at 9 a.m. Nice. Okay, good. And I'm on the third floor, though, and it's oh, stairs. So. I drink lots of water. <laughs> yeah, but we got some got some really good stuff in Kansas City last week. Uh, just looking at like thrift stores and huh. Facebook Marketplace. Well, um, show me some of the some of the stuff y'all got. We got Dad, pictures. Great. Did you see my free couch? Yes. yes. You're gonna be living first class. <laughs> I know that couch is like. I think the nicest couch that's ever going to touch that apartment complex for <laughs> college students. But I got a couch and, and a coffee table and two uh, matching small side tables and, and a coat rack from that one place, all free. Yeah. The fact that you are moving into your first apartment and you have a really nice matching set of furniture is crazy. I know. Well, I have three couches. I have three couches and three tables from my living room already. Yeah. For a first apartment and a TV stand and a TV. Oh my God, you're living large. And, and then I have another TV for my room. Dang. I yeah. know. It's it's crazy because we got, I mom found this TV on Facebook Marketplace and it's huge. It's, I think it's 50 inches. And that's. Right our living room TV and then a TV stand. And those are at Katie's house right now. She picked them up for me this week. Um, but those are really cheap. So we got that. And then Josh has two TVs and one of them just stays at his house all year. And he's like, do you want it? And I was like, sure. So I got a TV for my room. Dang. What did you get for uh, Cassandra's apartment? Uh, there was some couches and a desk. And a table with chairs for like the kitchen. Okay, um, nice. I think that was most of the furniture. I'm trying to think. There has to have been something else, but but yeah, she has like when you. It was really easy to move her in because she has like a sliding glass door. That's oh, very like nice. A patio area, but like it's not blocked off. So we just open that, and she's on the first floor. We just carried everything in there. It's so easy. Good. Good. So, but she has, when you walk in, she has like a living room area and then like a dining room and kitchen right there. And then there's a hallway and there's one room. I'm not really sure. It's like the bedrooms are kind of small, but like it's not that big of a deal. So then there's two bedrooms and then there's another room that looks like it's bedroom, like it's the size of theirs. So I don't really know what they're going to do with that room. And then they have two bathrooms, like one and a, one and a half bathrooms, you know what I mean? Um, but, but yeah very cool you girls yeah. are just doing great yeah <laughs> i'm completely in my pjs right now i'm we're driving all day it's like 10 hours in the car so i was like well i'll put on sweats and my like pj shirt this thing is like the size of a dress on me no judgment <laughs> no i i didn't get in on the beginning of the conversation I know the dorms at Graceland are not air conditioned. Do you have air conditioning? No, they are. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yes, dorms are not air conditioned, but my apartment is. That's wonderful. That's very good. You, you'll yeah. suddenly find you have a lot of friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, because so Tess is not air conditioned. Um, Walker is. So two of the girls' halls had air conditioning, but Walker's kind of not really a girls' hall anymore. It's a whole thing this year. The guys are not air conditioned, but the whole thing is, is HPs get AC and then people with doctor's notes get AC. Well, a lot of people end up getting doctor's notes. They're like, yeah, I really, really need this air conditioner. <laughs> a lot of doctor's notes. <laughs> I'm really so <laughs> Yeah, Tanner and Josh got one, so they have an AC this year. Yeah, so is, is Addison's dorm air conditioned? No. It is? No? No, it's not. <laughs> but I she, might want, she might want to come and sleep at your place. <laughs> hey, I got three couches. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I gave her my fan. So, and that fan works pretty well for me because it's only like 
two weeks since actually hot. Yeah. Um, and so I just, anytime I'm in my room, I just have that fan facing directly at me. Yep. On my bed. And it works really well. Um, but yeah, we, I have- Are the classrooms air conditioned at all? Any of the classrooms for your classes? Uh, I know Resh is, because Resh, Resh is like the science center and that's pretty new. Resh is really nice. Uh, I feel like Briggs is not. Briggs is old, so I don't think it is. But I think Briggs would be the only thing that isn't. I think most other, Shaw would be, like, yeah, no, I think it's just Briggs, which kind of stinks because Briggs is where, like, Briggs is more of, like, business classes, and those are my classes. Oh, yeah, well, that's good. <laughs> but, but other than, other than Briggs, I think everything's pretty much air conditioned. They got the AC in the gym now. Oh, good. So, which was apparently amazing at Spec this year. I mean, it's like, oh my gosh, this is life changing. I but, remember that it was really uncomfortable at Spec because it's just yes. a room with a whole bunch of people packed into it, all doing like physical activities, and there's no AC, and it sucks. Smell it. Well, yeah, and, it, it, it was. It was yeah. very. <laughs> and it was like it was like the worst was the services because quite literally like every single person at spec which is a lot of people all packed in one room very close together with no ac like it was just sheer body heat it was terrible but no i remember going outside after games and being like oh my gosh it's nice and cool out here and it's like 90 something yeah. <laughs> oh, i feel so bad for anyone that was an athlete prior to it having ac like all the volleyball girls Thing and no AC. Jeez, oh my God. But, but yeah. Right. Well, enjoy your movement day. Stay uh, hydrated and cool. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> All right. See y'all later. All right.